the world is shifting. Inspiration is everywhere. We learn about the best in ourselves from each other. I'm Will McPherson, and you hit rock bottom. Building your health and happiness from the ground on up. Basketball player back in the day could dunk. Mm, probably not right now. Maybe. Baby bees. Can you dunk? No. Still? No. Okay. That's gone. That's gone. Well, not a professional sommelier. Scott would be classified as a highly qualified wine aficionado, especially on Napa Valley. So, so Scott, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right. So I'm, I'm going to start out with a question that sounds a bit cheesy, right? But uh, maybe you could unpack a little bit about uh, uh, how and why you've woven yourself in the wine tapestry of Napa Valley. I mean, how can a guy, right, who's living a good chunk of the year in Chicago do this? How can he pull it off? <clears throat> well, we uh, are fortunate enough to share a home in Napa Valley. My brother lives in San Francisco, and he kind of wanted a getaway place out of town. And what better place than Napa? And so we went in on it with him. So um, I already, my wife and I already had a huge love of wine. So we try to get out to visit our Napa house um, about four times a year. And wow. whenever we do, we try to go to lots of wine tastings. Right. I mean, hey, man, you got to make your time there worth it, right? So uh, hit it yeah. up and hit it up good. So, you know, what's amazing to me is, uh, you know, I've been in Napa before, right? And and I, I always thought of it as, as this large chunk of land north of San Francisco, like half the state, half the size of the state of California. But it's really a couple miles wide and 30, uh, 30 miles long. <laughs> that's a That's a little plot, but it's one hell of a plot. Um, you know, so uh, Scott, let's, let's lead off, right? What we're all thinking here, uh, what is considered clean wine or, or maybe, uh, maybe some of us are afraid of drinking red wine because of the perception that it causes headaches or hangovers. Uh, yeah. What do you think? There's, there's a lot of buzz these days about clean wine and, and a lot of companies are trying to market as clean wine. And to a lot of companies, they just mean, well, it's biodynamically farmed and we don't use pesticides. But what, what you're getting at is the, the sulfites and the histamines in wine. And I think, uh, not I think, wineries add sulfites because it keeps helps the wine keep its color and keep its flavor. It's a preservative. But okay. too much sulfite, and that's going to give you a, a headache. Ooh. Okay. So... so- Go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was going to say, so so a lot of wineries are trying to reduce the amount of sulfite. They, If they add it, they want to add a minimal amount and keep it at a very low level. Uh, I was looking today, I think by law, it can be up to 350 parts per million. That sounds wow. like a bad hangover. By law. Yeah, it does. <laughs> but it's... But it is, but but the, but for the clean wine label, right? So we're talking maybe uh, ten parts uh, per uh, per million, yep. uh, right? Would be cool. It's something like one in a hundred people have uh, an allergy, a sensitivity to uh, uh, the sulfur dioxide, and, and only if a, you one do, out of a hundred. That's one. That's of, that's nothing. I mean, that's one percent. Right. That's common. And if you do, um, red wine is going to just be a killer for you. Well, there's that 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 leaves most of us, right? Uh, um, who are who are pretty good. So maybe a way to avoid it is 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 you know looking for a Napa Napa clean wide sounds good. And listen, Scott, Scott and I are walking the walk too, right? So we're we're drinking two Napa wines. So Scott, could you tell us uh, what you're drinking right now and show it on the camera? Sure. Uh, tonight I've chosen uh, Frog's Leap Zinfandel. Oh, uh, okay. Frog's Leap is uh, one of our favorites. We're wine club members, and uh, the Zinfandel is uh, blended with uh, some Petite Syrah, which is uh, you not uncommon to have Petite Syrah blended in with Zinfandel, and it's just really, uh, really fruity in the glass. I love fruit forward wine. I went over to Benny's uh, and I got emblem Cabernet Sauvignon from Napa Valley vintage 2018. Hmm. Uh, it is fruit forward and, and, and uh, there's a little black, black currant, broken cacao and a wisp of Eastern spices from the French Oak. Uh, so uh, like you said, right, it's 90% cab. It's 5% petite Verdal and 5% petite Syrah. 
So uh, I'm I'm really nice. digging this. Um, That's a really really cool blend. Is that a good blend you recommend it? So I just kind of yeah. I went in there. I spend a little bit more than I than I usually do on a bottle of wine. Not a lot, you know. Uh, to be honest with you, it was uh, uh, thirty seven dollars and ninety nine cents. And I, you know, just unless unless I'm going to uh, you know like one of your parties, Scott, I definitely <laughs> bring a little bit more expensive wine. But you know, Please for myself, do. if I'm having a pizza. I will get like a twenty dollar bottle of wine, but but tonight though, in honor of the podcast, I did uh, splurge a little bit, and uh, man, my taste buds are really uh, really appreciating it. I you know I've got uh, to do a, a palate cleanse, which I don't think I need a palate cleanse because I'm not going to drink any other wine. I do have uh, Ritz crackers with Trader Joe's uh, pub cheese uh, infused with horseradish. Uh, that's my cleanse. Trader Joe's. I don't know if I should eat it though. When I talk, maybe that'll, <laughs> that'll sound bad. Uh, I'm not sure, but, uh, uh, that, that, that is really cool. Um, so let's, uh, so we're moving on from our, our wine as, as I said, right. Uh, Napa is only a few miles wide and 30 miles long. Uh, but there are distinctly different wines produced on each end and, up and down, uh, I've heard someone kind of expound upon it, you know, this blessed plot, this lungs of Napa, right? Could, could you expand upon that a little bit? Uh, what, what, what are, I mean, it's such a small region, right? But there's all sorts of barriers and different, um, different temperatures affecting the grape differently. So maybe uh, tell, us, yeah. tell us a little bit more to understand Napa wines. Yeah, well, I mean, starting at the bottom of Napa Valley, you know, when you drive up from San Francisco and first get there, the the lowest um, uh, vinicultural area, Los Caneros, mm-hmm. is down at the southern tip of the valley. It actually uh, straddles Napa and Sonoma. Oh, and it does. Okay. Just it does, and it's close to San Pablo Bay, which is sort of the the northern tip of the bay. And so they experience; they get a little more fog. They experience cooler temperature temperatures at night and a little bit lower high temps during the day. So the cooler climate there. It's very good for Pinot Noir and uh, Chardonnay grapes, which Mm -hmm. are the two main grapes in sparkling wine. So many of the sparkling wine producers in uh, Napa uh, and Sonoma, uh, uh, Mom, Chandon, uh, Carneros, they, um, they have many, many fields there. It's just extensive, and it's pretty much all Pinot Noir and Chardonnay that they're growing down there because that's the perfect climate for it. Well, I, you know, my fa- everybody likes to talk about uh, uh, red wine, but uh, any any favorites of uh, of Chardonnay? Any places I guess that one could visit at the southern southern tip of Napa that you could recommend? Um, yeah, um, the well. Uh, technically it's a little bit further North. I mean, my absolute favorite yeah. Chardonnay is yeah. uh, cake bread. They're a little bit well, further that's a big north. name. <laughs> it is. Well, everyone talks about the cake bread Cabernet. I mean, a ton I of do. people <laughs> go, Oh, I love the <laughs> oh, cake I bread Cabernet. It. Yeah. And I tell you, you got to try their Chardonnay. Um, I mean, you know, I should get some for my mom. My mom loves Chardonnay. I assume, right. It's not a heavy Oak taste. That makes it fantastic. Correct. And it, and that's the thing with Chardonnay. We won't go down this rabbit hole, but <laughs> as 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 uh, somebody once told us, uh, Chardonnay is a very boring grape, and so that's why winemakers do things to it like uh, malolactic fermentation to give it the buttery flavor, or they mm. oak it and they make yeah. it oaky. And some people say they don't like Chardonnay, and it's it's because maybe you drank one that was over oaked or one that was yes. super buttery. And, yeah. and I think winemakers are trying to do a, something in the middle. They'll they'll blend some that was buttery with the malolactic fermentation, and some was in oak, and kind of put it together for for a more balanced flavor. My mom is a big Chardonnay wine drinker, so I think I'll take your advice and I'll get her a bottle of cake bread uh, Chardonnay. That sounds I think really she'll like good. It. I yes, think so. I think she will too. I think she'll like you even more than she likes you. And she likes you a lot. <laughs> Uh, if we get a bottle of uh, cake bread, so that's that's fantastic. Okay, so one's in the car and one one's in the southern tip of of this, yeah. this patch, right, hemmed in by all all of nature, and we're we're heading north. What's right. what's next? What's in the middle so, of the lungs? Well, you, you head you head north up into the valley, and okay, you get much higher temperatures. Um, you know, you'll regularly you get into um, July, August, September. Mm-hmm. You'll you'll 
your 90s every single day and you may even hit some 100 degree temperatures and it's it's hot and that that kind of yeah. heat is wonderful um for cabernet sauvignon for sure which is one of the i mean that's probably what napa is most well known for and um so that's you know north north tip of the valley uh calistoga up in that area uh-huh. uh, you're going to get more cabernet sauvignon and you're going to have a lot of heat there'll be the nights won't be as cold there won't be as much fog um so that's you know that's what they plant if, up there for my ignorance if the nights aren't as cold then maybe less condensation on the grapes as well do point yeah, I suppose. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, one well, never knows. Definitely. I guess. Well, yeah, but yeah. That, okay, so so cab. That's okay. That's something to learn, right? So so we got the high temperatures of of the north uh, where where the cab is, and weren't you telling me that the uh, uh, Pinot Noir? Uh, where's Pinot Noir grown? That's there. in the in the south in in Carneros. In Carneros as well with the Chardonnay. Yeah. Oh, okay. And and the other popular place for it is further north, north of Napa Valley in the Russian River Valley. So the Russian River Valley is is a little further north and east of Napa. Okay. And you you again, that's a a, a good combination of soils and climate, and you get a lot of Pinot Noir out of the Russian River Valley. And that sits up north, right? That that kind of uh, is on yeah. the on the scalp, so to speak, of yes. Napa Valley, and it's yeah, an ice like pack, s- so to speak, right? <laughs> it's yeah, kinda... by Santa Rosa. So, okay, so, um, all right. So that hems it in. Okay, so that is really interesting uh, for the Pinot Noir. Okay, uh, and then uh, northern part of the valley, you're telling me, and it rises to about 362 feet above uh, sea level. You're telling me, yeah, you got the Russian River there. It gets hot. Uh, you yep. got cab. Uh, what else you got there besides cab uh, in that area? Well, I mean, they're going to grow the the blending grapes that they're going to blend in too. Petit Verdot. Mm-hmm. Um, there'll be some Malbec, some Merlot. Um, most most of these winemakers, even you know, many many of them make a hundred percent cab, but they're also going to blend in small amounts of Merlot, Petit Verdot, Malbec. Um, uh, Cabernet Franc. So, I mean, they'll grow some rows of that. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. So, Sauvignon, Sauvignon Blanc. Let's yes, not and, oh, Sauvignon, Sauvignon Blanc. Blanc. Yeah, let's not forget Sauvignon Blanc. <laughs> yes. And that, I love okay. Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, yeah. So, uh, what is the difference between Sauvignon Blanc and, um, and uh, well, the other white wine? You know, Chardonnay. Chardonnay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sorry, I've so, already had too much wine. So, Sauvignon Blanc is, you know, it's it can be. Uh, a little more um, minerally, uh, like light fruity taste, like melon. Um, uh, it, I think people f- consider it a lighter, fruitier uh, white wine, uh, like a summer sipper, like perfect ah, on a okay. hot day. On a hot because day, yes. Chardonnay can have a little heavier mouth feel, and the Sauvignon Blanc is just really light. Okay, that makes sense. So, yeah, so from from south north, right? You fly to San Francisco. And rumor has it you were out there a couple of weekends ago uh, in Napa Valley. So, if one you know leaves the airport, uh, you rent a car, boom, you know you you cross the Golden Gate Bridge and you're driving up and you hit the south. So, the south uh, has um, uh, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir. Um, you know, sea level breezes from San Pablo keep the temperatures cooler and more moderate, right? Then as you head up yep. north, right, the the temps get a little warmer, right? And that's good for the cab and Sauvignon Blanc. For sure. For sure. I've had I've had days when we left our house, which is down in the Carneros region, and mm-hmm. it was cool and foggy. And when we drove north to the top part of the valley by Calistoga, there was zero fog and it was much hotter. <laughs> I mean, I noticed it within a few minutes. <laughs> So I think I'm beginning to figure out why Napa is such a such a national treasure because uh, it's only 30 miles long, but you have this huge diversion of temperatures and weather. That's there's microclimates all over the place in that. So, so that's an amazing. Uh, I they should almost make it a, a national park in a way. You know, so <laughs> in a way, in a way. Yeah. Well, yes, and, yes. and you get a diversity of soils too. So, yes. Um, let's talk about that. What, Scott, what makes them so special? I mean, what? it's it's hemmed in by two mountain ranges on the sides and those are volcanic soil all the way down the the top of the mountains all the way down through the hills it's volcanic and and really everything is is volcanic at the base but there are parts of the valley where 
over the years, sediment has flowed down from the hills. Yeah. So on top of the volcanic base, there's an, an alluvial fan of clay, sand, and gravel that has Mr. washed Fancy down. fancy alluvial fan. You described that perfectly. I just think of the soil like <laughs> fanning out on the bottom and making these this soil, right, which which – which gives it earthiness and minerality uh, besides the uh, fruit forward, right? So we can complete uh, compete head on with the French and maybe even beat them. Uh, what was the year that we went to France and <sighs> kicked their tail, like 75, 76, something like that? Oh, I don't want to say it was 75. Yeah, 75 or 76. The, um, the Yeah. They, they had the competition in France where they had – uh, some of the finest French wine experts blind taste uh, French reds and American reds versus uh, each other and uh, French whites versus American whites. And uh, in both red and white category, an American wine won. And uh, it it rocked the world. So um, that was there was a good movie made about it called Bottle Shock. Oh, it, Bottle uh, Shock. I want to see that. I think that's that's one of my top tens I want to see after uh, good. Uh, visiting Napa a couple of times. That's great. Um, yep. And then uh, I, I do love the Fruit Forward, though, the wines. You know, the the, the French are, are pissed off from that. And now they call Napa Valley Cabs uh, Hawaiian Punch. But uh, I think yeah. I think they're. They're a little overdoing it on there. So, okay, here's here's a little uh, uh, question for folks that are concerned about the uh, ecology or water consumption. Do you need a lot of water for growing grapes, like the lettuce industry? I mean, do you? I mean, are they just going to suck the reservoirs dry? You you don't. And I mean, they're pretty carefully regulated about their water usage out there. So, some farms, um, and I mean, let's be honest, these guys are farmers, right? That's what they right. are first. They have um, reservoirs that they've built, ponds they've dug out, or reservoirs that they've you know built up berms, and they try to collect as much water as they can in the rainy season to do some irrigation. But there are other wineries, actually, my friends at Frog's Leap are one of them, uh, where they practice dry farming. Uh, Tell they us intentionally about that. don't irrigate um, because when you don't, the the grape. Uh, the grape plant, th- those roots, they will find water. They just work harder. They reach down, down 10, 12 feet, maybe f- deeper. They reach down into the earth to find mm-hmm. uh, groundwater down there. Okay. And the effort of doing that, it makes the plant work really hard. And um, you end up with very uh, uh, tight uh the, the grapes, the the grapes are a little bit uh, de- uh, smaller and smaller. much more okay. dense flavor. Yes, powerful but small grapes with yes with you know that are worked. You know, so it's so that's something to think about, right? So when you get a powerful cab, right, it, they didn't use a lot of water to produce that. They let nature let the roots do its work. So that's amazing. And you mentioned uh, Frog's Leap Winery uh, for anybody else uh, thinking about uh, doing a quick weekend in Napa. Uh, what are you? What are a couple of more of your favorites that maybe they could uh, visit um, that you could recommend? Yeah, so I mean, we have guests out periodically, and I usually try to pick a place where you can get a a reasonably priced tasting that will give you some reds and whites because you've always got a mixed audience. Some you may have somebody who just wants reds, mm. and you may have folks that want whites. So I mean, that's why I pick places like Frog's Leap or Trefethen. Uh, family winery. It's close down in towards Napa, and they have a mix of reds and whites. Um, so they're kind of go tos that we we take guests to a lot, um, just because it's got a nice mix um, of wines. All right, that's that's really good information. So now everyone knows, like you know, uh, what to look for when you're starting out from the south to the north. What types of wines there are, you know, and, and I, I assume right. Uh, I think we talked about this in pre-show a little bit. Uh, uh, that some wines, some grapes do require a lot of water, and those are to produce, you know, box wines like Franzia mm. or something like that, right? And uh, and speaking of grapes, I, I I don't know when I was going to bring that up, but I guess it it comes up now. Uh, let's say you inherit a a uh, a plot of land in Napa, but it hasn't worked a long time, so. So I mean, so you get you know you, you get loans, you get capital, you get people investing in your in your vineyard. Uh, when can you even start going to market with some of the produce from some of the grapes going out 
that that would can make you know decent wines. I mean, how long does that take? Well, it's it's going to be a minimum of three years till you even get grapes that are of a size that are usable. Two and, years. And wow. Okay. Three. To get, yeah. It, but even then, I mean, your yield isn't going to be that great. I mean, you know the the plant the plants aren't that. You won't have that many branches, uh, shoots, and arms that'll be giving you that many clusters. So, yeah, you need. Um, I mean, three is at the minimum you'll start getting some product, but you know you're really going to be like probably five or seven years till you get really big full vines. That that sounds like a lot of people can't get in the game because it's too late uh, to get a return on that. I read somewhere, Scott, where it says seventy five percent of vineyards uh, in Napa are fr- family owned. That sounds really good. You know, it's not this huge corporation, but a family doing that. That sounds like a really nice part of Napa. You know, almost like yeah. it's a farming community. Right. And a, and a lot of those family owned farms, uh, I don't know. I was going to say they don't, they don't even necessarily bottle wine. They, they grow. I mean, they sell their, their farmers, they grow the grapes and they sell them to prisoner wine company or some uh-huh. other large conglomerate. Those people produce, you know, hundreds of thousands of cases of wine. They need grapes. And so they have to buy them. And so a lot of these families, I mean, they just, they grow grapes and they sell them. Um, so it, a big part of being a winemaker is yeah. um, get finding finding good farmers, good vineyards, and getting the contracts on those grapes. Well, that sounds good. And I'll tell you what, the producers have, uh, have uh, put some music on, Scott, and uh, you're going to go ahead and give your uh, favorite, um, your, your two wines that you've selected. So okay. folks, so listen in, right? Listen in. Scott's going to give you his two picks uh, that only he would know, right? Uh, so you're not going to get it from a wine magazine, but someone who really knows Napa and is, you know, I definitely consider him a super aficionado. So, Scott, if you could uh, give us your first wine, uh, okay. uh, what's the name, label, and what's some of the characteristics of it? Well, I mean, I guess I already kind of let the cat out of the, the frog out of the bag on this one. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I'm loving. So, I guess my rationale was everybody knows Napa's got caps, right? Great caps, yeah. tons of caps. So I was trying to pick something that was a little different and off the mark. So that's why I went with the Frog's Leap Zinfandel, right? Um, which is the blend of the Zinfandel and the Petit Syrah, and um, oh, that's uh, it's really fruity and it just fills the mouth, and um, it doesn't necessarily have all the uh, oaky hints that a, a cab does, but it's a fantastic Zinfandel. And then I did earlier mention, oh, go ahead. Uh, one thing, uh, what what can you, uh, what's a good dish to pair that with for folks? Oh, Zinfandel is often mentioned with like grilled meats, right? So if you're having ribs or, you know, a pork roast or something, I mean, uh-huh. Zinfandel's fantastic. That sounds really good with pork. Yes, that's that's good advice. All right, so uh, where can one find uh, uh, Frog Sleep uh, Zinfandel? The Frog Sleep Zinf- Zinfandel is available at Binnie's for $36. Oh, that's a good buy. That really sounds good, you know. Okay, so tell us uh, pick number two. Pick number two is another oddball. I mentioned Trefethin earlier. I am in love with a blend they have called Dragon's Tooth. The Dragon's Tooth is a predominantly Malbec wine. You don't see, Malbec's usually used as a blending grape. This is 40% right, yeah. Malbec and 32% Petit Verdot. And then the rest is made up with Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot, which are usually the predominant grape. But mm-hmm. to feature Malbec and Petit Verdot, um, I just, I love it. They're, they're very, um, very uh, tannic, um, very heavy. And I mean, you definitely want to go steak with this one. <laughs> oh, yeah. Making my mouth water. Uh, uh, once again, what, what's the uh, name uh, of this wine? Um, it's called Dragon's Tooth. It's from... their homage to their Welsh heritage. Ah. The dragon from the Welsh flag. Yes. And it's uh, $39 at Binnie's. At Binnie's as well. You can get that at Binnie's. Okay. Yes, Dragon's Tooth. Is that the name of the... 
uh, vineyard, or is it, or is it no, just uh, Trefethen is the wine. Trefethen, yeah, Trefethen. Trefethen okay, so family. How do you spell Trefe- T R E F T R E F E T H E N. All right, so these those are the two picks of Mr. Scott Bonthron and folks. Uh, you know, hopefully, uh, take his take his advice. Try something new, right? Uh, get out of Jewel Osco, and uh, although I'm tired of bashing Jewel Osco, I'm sorry <laughs> about that, folks. You know, so uh, okay. So um, you brought up Merlot, right? And in the movie Sideways, Paul Giamatti, uh, you know, just rips Merlot, right? He he he, he goes, but he you no. Know, before that, though, he said he, he goes. I like to think about all the people who tended and picked the grapes of the wine that I'm drinking. And if it's an old wine, how many of them must have died by now? And that's kind of a morbid way to look at things. But I like how wine continues to evolve. Like if I open up a bottle of wine today, it would taste different than if I open it on any other day because a bottle of wine is actually alive. And I think Paul's character got onto something, right? And I, and I, I think um, yeah. at Deerfield Caves, uh, there's someone who knows a lot about that, right? So how can, uh, what, what can you add on that? Like, you know, like decanting and aerating and how does that change your wine? Yeah, no, definitely. There are, um, there are wines that um, you want to decant and, and some that are, that don't necessarily need it. It's the decanting is the exposure to oxygen. Okay. Um, it it uh, it helps it uh, it lets it give off some of the uh, chemicals uh, and uh, perhaps um, odors that have built up. Lets it give that off, freshen up, mm-hmm. absorb in some oxygen, and it can improve the flavor. So if you open a wine and right. then just immediately pour it and taste it, yeah leave that bottle sit out for an hour and then taste it it again, again. it's going to taste different. Um, One of the, I think, I think that the, I don't know if it, the rule of thumb is the younger a wine is, the more time it needs to um, aerate, to, to, you know, decant. Ah, The younger it is. Okay. The more recent to vintage, let it breathe a little bit longer. That's kind of a rule of thumb. Probably doesn't apply to everything, but it's a good rule of thumb to have. Uh, What about aerate? What about, uh, I saw somebody aerate a bottle of wine. They they poured it through this, this, this device. And I don't know what it did. Uh, What goes on with that? Um, The idea there is um, uh, uh, using uh, titanium. Um, I've seen a number of devices like this where, um, some people have um, a pouring device that you pour through that has a titanium mesh, or um, you can squeeze, uh, uh, suck suck it in and uh, the wine and squeeze through uh, titanium. Um, the thought being that the chemical process, the interaction, it ages the wine um, wow. rapidly okay. for you right there. Rapidly. Wow. Right. So the thought is, you know, open your wine, taste it, and then if you do this titanium aging device and it tastes different, then that means your wine still has some life left to it, some aging. It it you if you have another one of those bottles, you yeah. can leave it laying down in your cellar for several more years because it it has growth. Since it has growth. Thing. Oh right. <laughs> wow. Okay. That's Oh, that's awesome, dude. That's that. Uh, so there are so many ways you can even affect the way your wine tastes, you know, by by putting air in it or letting it sit out. You know, it is a living, breathing organism. That's that's something to think about, folks. Hey, thanks for listening. And check out my website at William-McPherson.com. Building your health and happiness from the ground on up.